Hello, everybody. Thank you for um, joining us today. We have a great webinar lined up for all of you. I am Nora McDonald, Director of Marketing for Intercentive, and our featured presenter will be Phil Simon, award-winning author of five business management books, speaker, and technology expert. Before I pass the gavel over to Phil, I'd like to give a two-minute overview of Innocentive of who we are and what we do for our clients today. Innocentive is the open innovation and crowdsourcing pioneer, and since 2001, we have been helping companies and organizations solve problems that truly matter. We have worked with many businesses within several industries, such as pharma, life size, CPG, food and bev, and government, and so forth. Our offering includes a cloud-based enterprise innovation software platform called Innocentive at Work, as well as a very robust and proven consulting services and challenge methodology. And a unique differentiator, a solver community comprised of 285,000 problem solvers from over 200 countries. We also have many strategic partners with nature.com, nature Scientific American, and others yielding a total solver reach of over 12 million people worldwide. Our 10 years of experience, we have done thousands of challenges and successful IP transfers in and out of 70, 60 countries. So what really makes Innocentive different? We help you to rapidly engage both internal and external challenges of external talent, excuse me, to generate novel ideas and solve key problems, tapping into the world's cognitive sur surplus. You're, we are more than just software. Our tools, proven methodology, and expert service help you to embrace culture change, prove the way you work, and transform your economics of innovation, like quick time to value, risk mitigation, and pay for performance. We have built the world's preeminent open community of problem solvers. I mentioned 285,000 and counting, and, and with reach into the millions via our partners, as I noted earlier. We, and of course, we have a decade of experience and a proven track record helping our clients to achieve measurable innovation outcomes, not just generate unstructured ideas or provide a forum for social conversations, which may not lead to real solutions. So last but not least, you will pay for performance, a fundamental change in the economics of innovation. So before I introduce Phil, please note that we have a survey at the end of the webinar after we wrap up Q&A, and I would love if you would be able to provide your feedback. We, we value your insight, and, and we use that insight to optimize our webinar series throughout the year. So now let me introduce Phil Simon, our featured presenter. Phil is a sought-after speaker and the author of five management books. His most recent, Too Big to Ignore, The Business Case for Big Data, is hot off the presses and was just released two weeks ago this month. A recognized technology expert, Phil consults companies on how to optimize their use of technology. His contributions have been featured on CNBC, NBC, Inc. Magazine, Business Week, The Huffington Post, um, the American Express Open Forum, com Computer World, and so forth and so on. There's so many that he's been involved with. So without further ado, let me pass this over to Phil. Phil, take it away. Thank you, Nora, and thank you, everybody, for joining me today. I think we're going to have some fun talking about big data and open innovation, and we'll definitely save some time for questions at the end. As Nora said, I've written some books, and I do some speaking, and this is the most recent one. Too Big to Ignore, the Business Case for Big Data. So let's get into the agenda. What are we going to talk about today? First up, big data. What is it? It's definitely a buzzword, but there are a lot of definitions, a lot of characteristics of big data. Um, how did it evolve? What are some of its potential benefits? And what should you be thinking about uh, when you're embarking on a big data journey and how can open innovation help? Next up, how are some organizations actually using crowdsourcing open innovation and prize competition to harness the power of big data? We'll actually go through a couple of examples of incentive contests that have produced some really interesting results. And then finally, um, what can we learn from these case studies, right? What does that mean for our organization? We'll find that with big data, 
it isn't necessarily about following a checklist. It's much more about a culture, a mindset, a mentality. So those people who think that they can just do five things and boom, big data is working for them, well, maybe not as much. And as I said, we will definitely have time, probably about 10 minutes, give or take, for questions and answers. Okay. So big data, what is it? It's really hard to talk about big data without mentioning the three Bs, variety, velocity, and volume. Now let's talk about that for a minute. There is a greater variety of data now compared to even, say, five, seven years ago. When most people think of data, they think of structured information, say, a list of customers or sales in an Excel spreadsheet, or a list of um, employees in an Oracle database, as, as I said, a list of transactions. Uh, that structured data is still important, and anyone who tells you otherwise is, uh, <laughs> I think, a little delusional. However, that is only one type of data. Most of the data generated today, by some estimates, about 80%, is what they would call unstructured. It does not fit nicely into an Excel spreadsheet. We're talking about tweets or blog posts or photos or videos or comments on blog posts, not to mention the information generated by machines. So there is much more data being generated in terms of variety. The next B is velocity. The data is streaming at us faster and faster. While I was researching the book, I talked to one organization that said they have a government client that generates a million data points a second. And in the book, I quote, say, um, YouTube, I, I think it's something like 48 hours of video is uploaded every minute. I mean, it's an astonishing amount of data, which gets into volume. Uh, we've never seen data being generated at this rate before. In fact, I've read that the amount of data in the world generates uh, doubles now about every two years. It's an astonishing amount of data. Um, I had to learn terms like forget gigabytes and petabytes and terabytes. <laughs> I had to learn terms like yottabytes and zettabytes and you're talking about ones with you know, 21 or 24 zeros at the end. So when we're talking about big data, we definitely have to think about the three Vs. Uh, let me just activate this here, okay. Next up, as I said, 80% of this data is actually unstructured. You, you can't put YouTube videos uh, into an Excel spreadsheet and, and sort on them. It just doesn't work that way. Um, you can do some things with, say, Twitter, with blog posts, but most of this data is unstructured, and it fundamentally uh, does not work well with traditional tools. Forget Excel, even Oracle or SQL databases can't handle this type of information. Next up, it's increasingly external to the enterprise. Again, when most of us historically have thought it's of data, we've logged into our CRM application or our ERP system, and we work with data internal to the enterprise. Well, I will argue in the book that most of what we call big data is actually external to the enterprise. It exists on social networks. It exists on the Internet. Uh, most people think that Google does a very good job, for example, indexing the web. And while researching the book, I became familiar with this term, the deep web. So of all the information that Google is able to capture, only about 5% of it is actually captured. 95 or 96% of it is actually not available for even the best search engines like Google to index. Think about it. Google can't index private sites like LexisNexis. It can't necessarily go through your emails and index it. So you're talking about a tremendous amount of information that even Google can't get to. It's just a stunning amount of information. Next up, and this I, th I thought was also very fascinating, we generate and consume a tremendous amount of information. Think about this for a minute. If you go back even 10 years ago when people were just getting cell phones, well, you used a cell phone maybe to text and to call people. You, you really weren't using it to record videos or take pictures and post them on the web or watch Netflix movies. It just didn't work that way. Well, now with the cloud, with the pervasive nature of smartphones, with the decline in the cost of storage, with the rise of mobility, we are constantly generating and consuming information. And as much as that is, we ain't seen nothing yet. If you get into machine-to-machine -machine learning or sensors, there's a tremendous amount of information being generated automatically by machines. Some of you may have heard of the Nest thermostat. 
the guy who designed the first, I think it was 15 versions of the iPod for Apple, quit, and he designed a thermostat. And the Nest thermostat actually learns how you like the heating or the cooling in your house. It's generating, generating information. It's learning about what you like and when you like it. So I might like it at, say, 72 degrees in my home in July in Las Vegas where I live, but maybe I want it a little bit warmer in December when it actually gets a little bit cooler. So people have different preferences, and these machines are actually generating and learning uh, from the data available. Or if you look at planes, they're now putting sensors on planes that are tracking everything the plane does every second and taking that data and sending it automatically to data centers that actually can make the flights more fuel efficient or produce, um, produce better results, maybe avoid some accidents. So machines are generating a tremendous amount of information. And that gets very much into the Internet of Things. For those of you who haven't heard of it, we are going to have not just our computers or our iPads or our smartphones connected to the Internet. Uh, Google the Internet of Things. It is amazing to think about the future and basically everything in your home being connected to the Internet. Some other major characteristics of big data. It's inherently unmanageable in the traditional sense. Now, if you think about many people working in organizations, let's say there's a CRM application, you really don't want to add 15 different entries for the same customer, right? Because you're going to have a problem when someone asks the question, how many customers do we have or how many employees or how many products? So there are tools like MDM or Mass Data Management Solutions that allow organizations with complicated architectures to have a single version of the truth, one employee master, one customer master, one product master. Well, big data is not really like that. You can't stop me from tweeting the same thing a hundred times. Right? In fact, tweeting the same thing a hundred times may indicate a particular degree of feeling. If I tweet, say, my cable company sucks once, maybe that's not as significant, I'm not that upset, as if I do it 20 or 30 times. So there is no one master record. I can upload the same YouTube video a bunch of different times. So it's not manageable in the traditional sense. Next up, big data augments small data. If you take a look at a company like Amazon, for instance, Amazon knows exactly who buys its products. Okay? It has master information on all of its vendors. That is what I would call small data. Now, you can have big amounts of small data, but the small data is much more structured. You're talking about lists in the traditional sense. Well, if I know who my customers are with small data, and like Amazon, I can marry that to what they're doing with big data, then many of you may receive those emails from Amazon in which they tell you customers who've bought X also have bought Y. Those are often incredibly accurate, and Amazon does that through big data. For instance, my favorite TV show is Breaking Bad about a high school chemistry teacher who has cancer and starts manufacturing crystal meth to produce for his family. He doesn't want to die and leave them with a lot of debt. Well, Amazon knows that people who like Breaking Bad are probably also likely to enjoy shows about other morally complicated characters like, say, Mad Men or The Sopranos or The Wire. There are other companies out there that don't match on that kind of data. They'll say, oh, if you like Breaking Bad, you might like The Bad News Bears. Well, why? Well, both shows have the word bad in them, but if you've ever seen The Bad, New Bear, Bad News Bears, and that was one of my favorite movies as a kid, that has nothing to do with a high school chemistry teacher who manufactures crystal meth. So if you understand your small data, then you can get more mileage out of your big data. Big data solutions do not lend themselves to quick fixes. It's not what they would call, say, a package slam. I spent the first uh, 10 years or so of my career working on enterprise system implementations, and there was this pressure to get the system in as quickly as possible so you can run payroll, so you can do your accounting, so you can know your customers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, big data really isn't like that. In fact, it's more important to think of it as a mindset. It's not a project or an initiative. You're never really finished with big data. For instance, a year ago, no one was really talking about Pinterest. Well, now the company has a $2.5 billion valuation, and there is data on that site in the way of photos and boards and comments to different pins. Well, just as a small example, I'm an author, and I occasionally look at who's pinning the photos of my books. That's interesting information for me to have because maybe those people like my books and would be interested in future books. 
So this is much more of a process and a mentality. Next up, new tools are needed. As I said, you can't write a SQL, a structured query language statement, on petabytes of YouTube videos. It just doesn't work that way. Um, many new tools are out there like, say, Hadoop or NoSQL databases or columnar databases. The old boss may not be as good as the new boss. Okay? Um, next up. Okay. Now, big data actually lends itself to open innovation and crowdsourcing. And this is something I discovered when researching the book. Uh, big data is this very new term, and many of you may have heard of the term data scientist, someone who understands data modeling and statistics and the business and technology. The demand for them is far, far greater than the supply. So when you think about what open innovation can do in crowdsourcing with regard to big data, they both have a lot of things in common. Certainly, you can reduce cost. If you put a contest out there, then you may get a result from someone all the way across the globe. How would you have reached that person if you didn't put it out there as a contest? You're also able, potentially, to solve problems sooner. If you've got competition, just like anything else, person A, and we'll see this in the example, may have one way of doing it that may take six months or a year, but person B has a totally different approach that could take just a couple of months. Again, you don't know until you put these contests out there. The rate of innovation can also increase. You might see sort of an additive effect. Somebody takes the contest in one direction, and then somebody builds upon it, or the organization equipped with these new insights is able to do things a lot faster than if they had relied upon their own internal resources. Again, data scientists are tough to find, and they're also not cheap. Someone also may have a crazy idea that's just crazy enough to work. And importantly, you can gather new insights uh, into employee and consumer behavior. Um, big data and open innovation don't really lend themselves, as I said, to standard operating procedure. This is not simply a matter of generating standard reports and putting them on, on a dashboard. This is about exploring. In fact, as I argue in the book, with big data and open innovation, it's actually as important to start with questions as opposed to look for the right answer. There's a great saying, if you torture your data long enough, it will submit. In other words, if you are intent on looking at a customer data set and you want to prove that price is driving purchasing decisions, you can probably do it. But if you start off with that sort of provincial mindset, what if you're missing certain things? What if you're missing the seasonality? What if you're missing the age of the product or how that product was marketed? So it's really important to go in with both big data as well as open innovation with that open mindset. The questions, I would argue, will lead to interesting answers, but arguably more important, the questions will lead to better questions. And it's important to understand that going in. You'll be able to increase the understanding of problems. Remember, even an unsolved challenge may still shed light. Maybe you have a better definition of the problem. Maybe you know now what you didn't know. And I think that's very important. Again, big data is not a package slam. I can't tell people that after three months of using Hadoop, that there will be an ROI of 14.4%. I, I think that's just not possible to do. Even if the problem is not solved, you may understand it better. As Noor said before, think about it. You're only paying for performance or results. Some of you may have heard of the site Kickstarter, which is, which is one of my favorite sites. I back projects all the time. Think about it. You're, you're committing to do a movie or write a book or uh, create a new product but only if that project gets funded. So in a way, your downside is much less. Imagine spending millions of dollars on a movie or uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars on an album or new product, and there isn't a demand for it. You're only paying for the results, and I think that's, as Nora said, a fundamental shift in the way of thinking. Again, it doesn't mean that big data or open innovation guarantees anything, but what if you could only pay for the results? I think that's a pretty compelling idea. Access to global talent, to me, is, is one of the chief benefits. There are people right now, and we see this with some of the gamification sites, who come out of the woodwork and they chime in with all these crazy ideas. How else would you have reached them? Well, if you offer a prize, 
and in some cases it doesn't even have to be $500,000 or a million dollars. We'll see very shortly that in some cases the prize can be, prizes can be relatively small in nature, and being able to access global talent is really hard to understate. And ideally, it lets you rent before you buy. If you're not convinced of the value of big data, you've got this big data set, you don't really think that this has potential, we'll throw out a contest for a relatively small amount of money. That's a lot different than downloading Hadoop, which is open source and technically free, but with free or open source software, you have to think free speech, not free beer. Just because I can download Hadoop or an open source NoSQL database doesn't mean that I know how to use it, much less configure it. I'm still going to need consultants or data scientists or some other internal hires. So the ability to test the waters and kind of dip your toe in the pool is, again, really compelling here. Data scientists are very, very difficult to find. In fact, in the book, I quote a McKinsey study that by, I think it's 2015, something like 180,000 data scientists will be needed to manage all of this data. So being able to access a global talent pool just makes sense. So we've talked sort of abstractly now about a couple of tenets of big data and how open innovation and big data are sort of um, copacetic. Let's get a little bit more specific now and go into a couple of case studies. Two organizations that have used both open innovation and big data. And we'll see throughout that big data and open innovation actually get along fine. First up, and this actual study is in the book, there's an application called Street Bump. And Boston Mayor Thomas Menino isn't your normal mayor. He thinks about things very differently. And he wondered if there was a better way to figure out where there were potholes in and around Boston, other than people driving over them and getting a flat tire or calling up their local um, government and screaming at them. So Menino contracted Innocentis and developed an app called Street Bump. And Street Bump would be installed voluntarily, of course, on people's smartphones. And when they drove around, if they drove over a pothole or around a pothole, that data would be registered automatically. Now, if only five people did it, that really wouldn't be valid. Maybe people picked up their cell phones, maybe they dropped it, whatever. But if you're talking about hundreds of thousands of people, the odds of it being a coincidence are actually very small. So they launched the app. And the initial app was probably a little bit clunky, but think about it. The iPod and the iPad evolved, too. These things get better over time. As I said, big data and open innovation are journeys. They're not sprints, so you have to be open to feedback. So they wind up tweaking it, and eventually the, the results came from all over, but three ideas were ultimately instrumental in the creation of this app. And at the time that I wrote the book, more than 120,000 bumps had been registered. And it just lets government work more efficiently. Um, I don't think you are going out on the ledge if you say that regardless of your political affiliation, based on how things are in this country, governments will have to do more than with less. So this is an example of sort of a good government, public-private hybrid. But to me, and it's funny, I was talking to my mother yesterday. I sent her a copy of the book. And she said, yeah, I, I read the story about Street Bump, and I called the mayor here in, in New Jersey where she lives. And she said, oh, they, they said they can't do that. <laughs> well, clearly you can do that because Boston's already done it. So as I said, to me, this is much more about a mindset and changing the way that people think about things. Because once you open things up, yeah, five, seven years ago, something like Street Bump would have been a pipe dream. Well, now we saw that it was very effective, and Boston was very pleased with it. In fact, other cities are actually following the lead of Menino with Boston. So this is an example of an interesting uh, public-private um, hybrid. Next up, here's one from healthcare, and there was an incentive um, prize with Prize for Life on ALS, which stands for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or as it's better known, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, which is a disease of the nerve cells in the brain and spinal cord that control voluntary muscle movement. So historically, this has been a very difficult disease to try to cure, and there are a lot of reasons for that. Uh, first up, once you have it, ALS typically uh, kills people in three to five years. So because of that, there isn't a lot of time to develop a clinical trial. You don't have the same sample. You don't have as much data as you would. 
from an economics perspective, I used to work in the pharmaceutical industry, and a blockbuster drug costs anywhere from $800 million to a $1 billion to develop. So if you were running a pharma company, yes, you want to do good things. However, you're also running a business. So what happens if you're unable to get the sample to diagnose the disease, but there isn't that same time to actually get that return on your investment? There needs to be the incentive for the pharma company to develop drugs. So through an incentive, um, the Prize for Life Challenge wanted to predict the progression of the disease in ALS patients based on the patient's current disease status and clinical metadata. And to solve the contest, the prize was $25,000. Interestingly, over 1,000 active solvers from 64 countries came to the, the plate and said, all right, let's, let's give it a shot here. And without going into all the details, the results, I think, were actually very interesting. They were able to reduce the number of patients required for a clinical trial by 23%. Now, as I said, you're not necessarily going to solve every problem with big data and open innovation, but I think we can all agree here that if you reduce the number of patients, you're closer to that solution. Or maybe that's not going to happen tomorrow or six months or a year, but all else equal, that is helping us get to where we need to be. So these are some possibilities with regard to big data and open innovation. What are some of the barriers to adopting them? And in fact, there are a lot of commonalities among um, people with regard to big data and open innovation. First up, both topics are relatively new. Certainly big data, we've heard about only very recently. Two years ago, I had never heard the term. In fact, I had read a book a couple of years ago that was all about big data, but the guy couldn't find the name of it for big data. So we've been kind of around this for a long time, but we've only now pegged it as big data, which probably helps since now we're, we're talking about, even though there are, as I said before, many definitions and characteristics of big data. But because it's new, it's not hard to understand why many sort of old school CEOs and CTOs don't want to jump on board, right? You don't want to spend a lot of money on Hadoop or data scientists, and then you don't get the kind of results you expected. Uh, you don't want to put a data set out there for a challenge necessarily, and then someone takes that information and somehow uses it against you. So in some instances, I think people are a little wary of these solutions uh, because they're very new. Second up, with regard to big data, many organizations aren't exactly flush with cash right now. I had read a statistic a couple of weeks ago that something like with the federal government, 70% of all IT spending supports legacy applications. Well, when 70 cents on the dollar does that, that doesn't give you a great deal of money to innovate. So even though ultimately these things may save money or generate more money in the long term, organizations with static budgets may not want to jump on board here. When times are tight, we often stick to what we know. Probably, in my opinion, the single key element here is the limited availability and skill sets of people. Most organizations can't afford a, a data scientist, and there just aren't that many of them. To me, this only underscores the need to look at open innovation as a viable alternative. As I said, with big data, through sites like Incentive, you can get a little bit pregnant, right? You can spend a relatively small amount of money and run a contest and see if you get the kind of results you expect. Now, that doesn't mean that you want to run everything through a contest five, ten years down the road, but you can almost look at a gamification site in a way as a proof of concept. And you may ultimately decide, as, as I'm sure many incentive clients have done, what kinds of projects they want to do internally and what kinds of things they'd like to run through a proper contest. But fundamentally, it is not easy, nor is it cheap, to find people who will make big data magic happen. Next up, what constitutes a success? Many CTOs and CIOs want basically proof before they do something, right? Well, what if we go to the cloud? How much money will we save? What if we buy a new CRM and deploy it? What's the ROI going to be? As I said, it's very difficult to quantify what would happen for a number of reasons. First of all, as I said earlier, we don't know what kind of questions we're going to answer. We may wind up asking new and, and better questions, but we don't know. It's, we're not running an experiment here. It is very difficult to look at these things in isolation, right? What would the iPad be for market share if there weren't? competitors. Who knows? It'd probably be higher, but who can say with any kind of uh, certainty? So it, 
it's very difficult to know in advance what's going to happen and then what constitutes success. Is it a 5% increase in market share? Is it a 10% increase in profits? What if things were really going bad and your customers were leaving and through big data you garnered new insights and few of those customers left? So in some cases, it isn't a matter of simply saying, did we increase this business metric by 10%? What if we stop the bleeding? What if things are no longer going down? It's just a lot murkier with regard to big data. And the ROI, I believe, is extremely difficult to quantify because this is not transactional stuff. This is not replacing hardware. And you can say, well, we used to spend this much on electricity or this much for data center, and now we spend 30% less. We don't know what we're going to find with big data, which in my view makes it very difficult to precisely quantify a successful outcome. Next up, culture. In many organizations, decisions are not made by data, period, big or small. And in my own career, I've actually, just to share a story, have done some analysis on, say, recruiting in an HR department and asked the question, should we be recruiting at Ivy League schools? And more or less proved that it was silly for us to do it because we spent a lot of money on salaries and recruiting. We got very few people who agreed to join the company I was working for at the time, and those people ultimately left after a very short period of time. We ought to focus, I argued, and showed with the data, on state schools because we spent less on salaries, we spent less on recruiting, and those people stayed with us longer time. Unfortunately, when I presented that to the director of recruiting, I got the answer of, well, we like recruiting at these schools. <laughs> so in a culture like that, it's very difficult to gain any traction with regard to any kind of data because that type of thinking isn't rewarded there. And I think the same thing applies to open innovation. Next up, fear of failure. You know, imagine spending three or four million dollars on a big data initiative, even though I don't like to call them initiatives, right? You, you, you hire the data scientists and you use Hadoop and NoSQL databases and, and all these things and you don't make it happen. Well, there are many, you know, CIOs who aren't necessarily near retirement, but as you get older, sometimes you get more conservative, and they only look at the potential downside. As I said, there's no guarantee with big data. There's no guarantee with open innovation. If you fear failure, then it's very possible that your organization will not get on board with either a big data or open innovation. Fundamentally, I have found in my consulting career that people are very uncomfortable with the unknown. Maybe if you're an employee, you find that you're, you haven't been making the right decisions and the data disprove what you're doing. That makes people very uncomfortable. Who wants to constantly look at data when making decisions? I don't believe that big data can answer every question, but if you give me the choice between making a decision without data and making a decision with data, I'll opt for the latter any day of the week and twice on Sunday. So sometimes we don't know what the outcomes are going to be, and that makes people very uncomfortable. So we know these are the barriers. What are some tips? How can we actually make this happen? First up, um, it's, I think, important to focus on measurable results, but not in a precise ROI. If we are now retaining 80% of our customers as opposed to 70%, I think that's a very interesting metric. Or if we have stemmed, as I write in the book, some organizations like Xerox and HP are using big data to proactively, proactively identify employees who may leave the company, I think that's a very important thing to know as opposed to a precise ROI. Um, big data really doesn't lend itself, in my opinion, to projects and initiative. It is more of a mindset. And to that end, um, it is important to look at it holistically. Next up, realize that all challenges will not be solved. As we said before, with the incentive contest, not, no one's batting a 1,000 here. It's totally possible that you throw a data set out there or a challenge and nobody comes up with the answer. Now, it might just be too difficult of a problem. Maybe the prize isn't high enough. There are all sorts of reasons that the incentive knows, but you can't guarantee any type of uh, result. And if that's your criterion, for proceeding, well, we have to guarantee that we're getting a result. Um, I, I don't think that you're going to be successful. But remember that a non-solution is not necessarily a failure, right? Again, using the ALS example from before, you know, no, it didn't result in a cure for ALS, right? And that's unfortunate, but we're closer to the solution. I don't think that contest by any definition could be considered a failure. And to me, the better question is not did we quote unquote fail, do we know more now than we did before? And some problems 
really across different industries and across different disciplines can only be tackled in chunks. It's unlikely that you're going to have that sort of eureka moment in which everything comes together. Typically, science and knowledge advances in a very additive fashion. We build upon what's been done before, and big data and open innovation allow us to keep building and get closer to our goal. Which brings me to one of my favorite quotes from Thomas Edison. I didn't fail, I just found a thousand ways how not to make a light bulb. I think that's the perfect way of looking at it. And if you nail it on your first or second or fifth try, that's great. But the more complicated the problem, and, and Edison really wasn't working on how to build a better uh, game of Monopoly here, <laughs> working on something a little bit more revolutionary than that, uh, it is important to think about that in those terms. I tend to think of the world as consisting of three major groups, people who get it, people who don't get it but want to get it, and people who don't get it and never want to get it. I don't like focusing on that third group. I think if you focus on the open-minded and what I would call the data files, the people who just believe that data can matter and do really interesting things, I think you'll have a lot more success than trying to convince people who don't want to buy uh, what you're selling. Next up, aim for little victories. I think that if, again, the ALS example is a good one, if you can focus on reducing the size needed for the clinical trial, then that ultimately will result in finding a cure that, to me, is more attainable than putting out a contest on a, on a site like Innocent and saying, well, we want to cure ALS. Everyone wants to cure it, but realize that, I said, as I said before, this is going to be an iterative process. So I think if you aim for little victories and then you exceed them, that's great. I'd rather say we're going to increase our market share from 5% to 10%, and then maybe it's 12 or 13, as opposed to, say, go from 5 to 80 and we were only 20. So there's something to be said for under-promising and over-delivering. The beauty of big data and open innovation, in my opinion, is that you can start small, small and organically. If you go back 15 years ago to very big, cumbersome, expensive, uh, long ERP, CRM, and, and business intelligence or, or BI applications, you were really talking about a huge commitment. There was no way that an organization would implement its own BI solution, for instance, in a pocket of it, right? That just, that happened very rarely in my experience. These were enterprise-wide endeavors. You know, with big data, with cloud-based solutions, with gamification sites, you actually can start in an individual department or group or division. You don't need everybody to approve. And as I said before, if you start to communicate those victories, then people come to you, and I think that your odds for success will be a lot higher than if you force it on people. Managing expectations, under-promising, and over-delivering. Again, it is very important for people to be pleasantly surprised. Think about it. This is why the weather is typically wrong, and they've done studies on this. The weather men or women want to tell you in advance that it's going to rain and it doesn't because you'd rather be pleasantly surprised than if they said, oh, it's going to be sunny today, and all of a sudden you got hit with a bunch of snow. So there are ways to manage expectations to get better results. Building internal momentum, absolutely huge. You want people, and I write about this in the book, to come to you as opposed to forcing it on them. If some people don't get big data or open innovation, you don't necessarily have to convert them. Hopefully enough people through webinars like this understand what's possible here, and then they come to you and they ask the questions, how could we do this or how have you seen this done, as opposed to I don't want to see this, I don't want to hear about this, go away. Building that internal momentum hopefully will result in a much higher likelihood of success. And to that extent, communicating victories, whether it's on an internal uh, internet or communication or newsletter, you know, there's nothing wrong with showing people, hey, this is what we did uh, with big data. In fact, I actually encourage it. That way it's not just some big company. It's not just Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google using big data. It actually can be done on, in much smaller enterprises. And engaging others, encouraging them to participate is actually huge. Um, a lot of people do want to gather, um, acquire these new, new set, uh, skill sets. It doesn't mean that you're going to be a data scientist by reading a couple of blog posts and listening to a webinar. It, it takes a lot more than that. But there are people who are willing to learn, and I think it's a great idea to encourage them uh, to participate. Okay, that leaves us with about 15 minutes for uh, questions, and I can take some, or Nora can take some, but Nora, I'll turn it back over to you. Great. Thanks so much, Phil. That was fantastic. Um, everyone in the audience, please submit your questions through the chat, and um, we'll get to them. And if we don't get to them, we'll...
certainly follow up with after the webinar. So a couple ones that we have in so far, Phil, are so at the very beginning of the presentation, you had mentioned that 80% of the data is unstructured. How yes. do you mine that, you know, that 80%, which is a lot, you know, get to the nuggets of really rich data? And how do you know, what, you know, what to look for? Sure. Well, so let me take the first part of the question first and the second part of the question. There are tools out there that allow for text analytics. So if you've got numbers, those are obviously easy to add or subtract or multiply or divide. Um, you can do simple keyword counts. So if you're looking at Yelp reviews, you're looking at for the, you know, certain words, positive or negative. But there are actually text analytics applications out there that can turn the morass of unstructured information into something valuable. A great example here, again, with healthcare is a medical record. Forget making it electronic. That helps, but that still just makes it electronic. It actually doesn't turn it into analytics in the true sense. So through tools like text analytics or NLP, natural language processing, you can actually discern sentiment from that, which I think is really important. Uh, it isn't just scanning in a document because, yes, the, the next question is, okay, what do we do with this? You do need extra tools. And what was the second part of the question again, Nora? It, it was more or less, you know, how do you mine it, you know, to get the you get to get to those nuggets, and then what, you know, what what do you know, what are you looking for, you know, do, how do you know you sure. get the right info? Sure. Well, a couple things. You, I think it's important to start with a hypothesis. We think that this is happening, but then test that hypothesis. Look at the data and actually see if that supports your central theory. But be prepared to be wrong, short term and long term. In other words, I may think that employees are leaving my organization because of salary, but if I'm only looking for that, then I'll probably prove it. What are some of the other reasons? Do they not like their managers? Do they not like their advancement opportunities? Uh, in the book, I write about companies that have actually looked at data on their employees and said, wow, people who've been in this particular role for three years and haven't been promoted are extremely likely to leave. That doesn't mean that you can pr promote everybody, but going in with an open mindset is really important. And I'd add that your answer may be true now, but it may not be true or as true in six months. So don't think that you've solved the problem and the data set remains constant. People change whether they're customers or partners or employees. Okay, good. So this is a, this is a good segue into this next question. Um, how are businesses dealing with so-called imperfect data, you know, like uh, in transient data, like, you know, weather, battlefield? You know, how, what is, um, how are businesses dealing with that? Well, I think that the most intelligent ones are using basically crowdsourcing and the law of large numbers. So if you go into Google, and I write about this in the book, and Google's a great example because I can't think of a better big data company, but there are lessons for smaller companies. If you go to Google and you type in how to write a book, if you're using autocomplete, you don't have to get to the word book. In, in fact, as I write in the book, even if you mistype it with some errors, Google figures out that you meant to write this. So if you have imperfect data from one or 10 or 100 searches, can you draw patterns based upon user habits? So if it's imperfect for one person, maybe they did want to type in how to write a BOK, right, B-O-K. Maybe that's an actual search. But Google is suggesting that you actually meant this. Or with Amazon, if you're looking for a book and you get the title wrong, they have looked at errant search results and said, oh, you meant how Too Big to Ignore by Bill Simon. <laughs> so they're learning as they go. But I think it's a very important question because there will never be perfect data. You can't possibly capture every tweet, right? This isn't structured or transactional data. You want to grab every sale. You want to grab every employee paycheck. That's a given. And the way those applications are written, you can query certain tables that have them. Now, if someone's not putting in a check and cutting it on the side or someone's not entering every customer sale, that's a separate problem. But in the small data world, Nora, you have a much better chance at getting, quote, unquote, perfect information, although big organizations I've never seen um, with perfect data. With big data, you're less likely to have perfect information, but if you look at things probabilistically and say, look, we, we have, we think, 80 or 90 percent of the tweets or most of the related blog posts or most of the unstructured text digitized and run through text analytics, then we could be confident, not necessarily positive, but confident that we're moving in the right direction. Uh, Voltaire once said, perfect is the enemy of good, and I think that absolutely applies with regard to big data. Okay, great. Okay, great. So what, um, 
Here's one from the audience. What are the best steps to qualify yourself as a data scientist? Background that is considered required along with skill sets. Okay, well, part of it is statistics. Part of it is data modeling. Part of it involves technology. You know, it is a relatively new term, and there aren't that many of them, but don't think that you can send someone to a course and they had a background with a little, you know, you don't really turn a, a recent college graduate from, say, economics and take, send them to a one-week data scientist course and boom, you're a data scientist. It is very, it, it's not really a proper statistician, although it helps if you have a background in stats. It really is sort of a hybrid of a number of different fields. Um, it's very difficult to say, well, you know, I, I, I have a degree in data science, although there are schools, and as I write about in the book, like Carnegie Mellon, my alma mater, that are offering uh, degrees in, in data science and big data. But you don't turn someone into them overnight. It's probably more of a journey. If they've got the backgrounds in the fields that I mentioned before, you're certainly off to a good start. But to me, the term data scientist, nor is very similar to the term social media expert. You know, what does that mean? Anybody can claim that he or she is a social media expert or a data scientist, but that doesn't necessarily make it so. Okay. Okay. So we have a we have about ten more minutes. We have a bunch of questions. Um, how, Phil, in your opinion, how do you get buy-in or pitch management the journey of OI and big data within an organization? I know you mentioned some of the barriers, and you talked about some of the culture, but you know, as you said, it is a journey. You know, so how how do you get that buy-in and build that internal momentum? You give the decision makers my book. <laughs> Um, I don't think that'll hurt, but all kidding aside, um, I guess that like anything else, you could focus on the carrots or the sticks. And part of it, I think, is understanding the culture, but by carrots and sticks, I mean you could say, hey, this is what Google's doing, or this is what um, uh, Street Bump, uh, the, the Street Bump app did with the city of Boston. So this is possible. These are the carrots of doing it, right? Imagine how much money we can save. Conversely, you can focus on the sticks. Well, what happens if we don't take advantage of this information? What if we're only relying upon small data? What if we're missing out on there are companies like DataSift that mine the, the data from social networks and turn it into much more uh, user-friendly data? What if we did use that? What if we understood our customers better? What if we were able to innovate faster? Um, if we didn't use those, then obviously we wouldn't do as well. But I think that it's important to understand the culture of the organization. I'm not saying anything out of school here when I claim that some organizations have been historically uh, much more open to open innovation or data-oriented approaches. I used to work for a credit card company, Capital One, in Richmond, Virginia, and there everything was about data. At Google, my, my best friend is a VP of HR there, and they often quote W. Edwards Deming, in God we trust, all others must bring data. So if your organization embraces the data mindset, you're going to have a better chance but if you're in a much more conservative, uh, data agnostic, or hostile environment, your odds are, I think, a lot lower, and you have to decide which battles you're going to fight. Um, I argue in the book that you can't do big data as a side project. You can't be a full-time accountant and then really harness the benefit of big data for 30 minutes during lunch. I mean, if the, if the buy-in isn't there in the organization, within a particular leader or within a particular group, then you have to decide if you want to fight that battle. There, there's no secret sauce, although hopefully my book will open some eyes. Okay, great. Very good. So you mentioned about small victory and orga um, organically. Um, but since the data is so big, any suggestion on how can uh, can do this in an agile way to handle the data monster? Any example of this? And I would say part two of this question, too, is, can you also give some examples of, you know, companies that are really killing it with big data? Okay. Well, let's first talk about the iterative or agile nature of it. I, I completely agree. If you're trying to, you know, Google eventually was able to index the web, uh, but maybe it's hard to necessarily start off with ambitions that grand. So there is something to be said for doing it in an agile way. I completely agree. It's probably dangerous to have a waterfall approach to big data. And by that I mean we're going to plug in 150 data sets because that's all there's out there. And after that, then we'll see if this stuff works. Because guess what? In the time it took you to plug in those 150 sources of data, there's been 151 and 152. So I think that starting in an agile way and seeing where it takes you is very important. Remember, in my opinion, there's no such thing as a comprehensive data set. 
you know, if Google can only index 4 to 5% of the web and it's Google, uh, what does that mean for you if you're trying to do something independently? In terms of examples of companies killing it, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, uh, Netflix, Twitter. Netflix is actually amazing. It's a true story. Amazon has learned through big data who watches what when, but also who stops what when. So Amazon, through the streaming service, Netflix can tell you which users stopped, say, uh, a particular movie at a particular point. And then there's just something within stopping at that point that signifies that maybe this person didn't like that kind of movie and maybe we should recommend different movies to that person. Netflix just spent $100 million on a series called House of Cards with Kevin Spacey and Robin Wright. That's a lot of money. And if you look at Netflix's financials, content acquisition for them is absolutely huge. So they're trying to create original content. Well, I'm telling you this story because Netflix knows through its data that certain people are more likely to respond to certain types of trailers. So, for instance, David Fincher, who directed Fight Club, directed the first two episodes of House of Cards. So Netflix used that information, and if you gave, say, a David Fincher film like Fight Club five stars, then you would see an ad that heavily promoted the fact that the first two um, episodes were directed by David Fincher. Well, what if you have no opinion on Fight Club or other David Fincher films? But what if you like movies with Robin Wright Penn, right? Maybe you like Forrest Gump. Well, you would see ads or or clips from the trailer that featured the female characters. So you're talking about the same series marketed to two very different types of customers in slightly different ways. And big data really allows people to segment. Again, it's all about recognizing with, with Netflix, and they actually used a contest, if you remember, I think it was seven or eight years ago, they offered, was it a million or two million dollars, if anyone could figure out a better movie rating algorithm? So even the big companies, and NASA's another one, even though they have these massive budgets, they still embrace big data. They still understand that open innovation is important. So don't think that just because you're a big company, you have to do it all internally, and you certainly don't want to do it all in a waterfall method. And at the end, like, it's like you're building a house. When the people move in, you don't really want to find out that there was a problem with the foundation. Okay, good. So we have time for two or three more questions. Um, we've gotten this throughout um, from a few people, but one of the questions is, is incentive an idea management tool, and is it available in the cloud? So I'm going to answer that. Yes, Innocentive offers a challenge platform that reaches internal users and a network of over 285,000 external solvers. The, pro the, the platform is cloud-based, and um, we use it to run general ideation challenges and campaigns, as well as highly technical, scientific, or you know, big data. So that answers that. Um, Phil, think about this. Put yourself five years in the future. When you look back, what do you see? It's funny. I use my iPhone or I've seen a, an iPad, and I think about what we can do now, and I laugh because in five years we're going to go, remember when we thought when the iPhone was cool? I mean, think about wearable technology. Think about the Internet of Things. Uh, Ray Kurzweil writes about this in his book, The Singularity is Neo. We're becoming fused, for better or worse, with computers. If you think about Fitbit or Apple's rumor to be working on a watch, as is Google and Samsung, we are going to be generating even more data ourselves at CES. A couple of months ago here in Las Vegas, they unveiled the Happy Fork. And for those of you who haven't heard of it, you can Google it. It's H-A-P-I Fork. It's a fork that has a um, sensor in it that monitors how fast you eat. So if you're trying to lose weight, one of the tips is don't eat so fast, right? Let your stomach be full. We're going to see more and more things like that. Or if you think about Google Glass with augmented reality, Imagine wearing a pair of glasses and you look at the Eiffel Tower and it recognizes that and it tells you how tall it is and when it was formed and it was like a Wikipedia page brought up right next to the Eiffel Tower. Or you're walking past someone on the street and the photo or the facial recognition technology says, oh, I actually know that person. That person's in my social network. So as, as cool as I think things are now, it's going to get even cooler, which also brings up some issues with privacy and security. But like anything else with, with big data, there are pros and there are cons. I think the good outweighs the bad, um, but it's definitely a, a, a balance, in my opinion. Okay, good. So we have one a time for one last question. 
Uh, are there good resources, blogs or books, to help develop good use cases for analytics and big data? We, the, the person asking this qu um, question is a healthcare startup and they are looking for opportunities to use big data to improve clinical research. Yeah, I'd say uh, check out the book. I profile a company in Cleveland called Explorus and they deal with healthcare organizations and they marry uh, hospitals' internal data with external data. So for instance, uh, maybe they can identify a potential communication issue because people keep going to the ER. And there's nothing wrong with going to the ER, but it's typically very expensive. What if you didn't know that there was an urgent care or a doctor's office right around the corner? Maybe we just need to communicate with people better. So uh, I could have written an entire book just about healthcare and big data because there is so much opportunity. It's, I mean, think about it, it accounts for what, 17% of our economy? and healthcare is still growing at 6 to 7% a year. Don't get me wrong, I don't think that big data will fix healthcare in and of itself, but there is tremendous room for improvement in the book. I write about a couple of examples of organizations, even small ones. Explorers is not a big company. I think they have 100 employees or something like that. So if you embrace big data in your culture or in your DNA, you don't have to be, in my opinion, a company the size of Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google to start to see the results. Okay, great. Well, that we've reached the top of the hour, everyone. Thank you so much for attending, and thank you for submitting your questions. We really appreciate it. Have a great day.